So I'm Michael Grant, and I'm Patrick Murphy, my uh, BSA co-chair. Co and this evening session is it's all about the water. And before we jump in and introduce the speakers, I'd like to mention next month's session. So next month, February 17th, um, we're going to have a topic that I know I, as a practicing architect in Boston, am hearing more and more about and is becoming more and more critical to our practice, which is embodied and operational carbon. And that's something that Patrick's been busy organizing. So I'll let him give you a little more detail about that session. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, so next month we will have uh, Elaine Hoffman and Lori Ferris from Biddy Clancy presenting uh, case studies of uh, utilizing embodied carbon and operational carbon uh, analysis early in design to inform design decisions. Um, so I know, you know, for me as an engineer, um, you know, hearing them talk about looking at not only the impact of, say, a building envelope retrofit to um, improve the thermal performance of the envelope, looking at it not just from an energy or a life cycle cost perspective, but also on the embodied carbon. Are we going to save as much carbon as we consume in the process of retrofitting? So really interesting topic, really timely. Um, and stay tuned to the BSC website, uh, BSA Cope um, Promotions. Uh, you can follow Michael and me on LinkedIn and uh, see the promotion for that on the 17th. Fantastic. That's going to be really great, I think, for the for the membership. So that, again, is Wednesday, February 17th. Thanks, Patrick. So um, I'd like to introduce our speakers um, for tonight's session. First, I want to thank the three of you um, for coming to talk to the Committee on the Environment about water and site design. Um, and uh, first, I'd like to introduce Shauna Gillis-Smith. Shauna is a landscape architect. And she founded Ground Inc. Landscape Architect in Somerville. Um, what is it now, Shauna? About 15 years ago. Um, and has thrived and built a practice that I've watched and admired for many years. Um, and they particularly focus on public and urban work. She's also currently a trustee at the BAC and a past member of the board of directors of the Boston Society for Architecture. She's also a former co-chair of the BSA Urban Design Committee. Um, we also have Brian Vincesi, um, who is the president of Irrigation Consulting. He's a past president of the Irrigation Association and the American Society of Irrigation Consultants. He's the chair of the Smart Water Applications Technology Initiative, as well as the IA Standards and Codes, Codes Committee, and was the 2009 EPA WaterSense Irrigation Partner of the Year. Derek Anderson is the Boston Water Resilience Leader for Arab, and he leads Arab's Boston Site Civil Team. Uh, his specialties include resilient site design, utility infrastructure, and sustainable stormwater management solutions. And uh, he's led the development of a number of Arab's new tools, including the Water Energy Tool, WET for short, for assessing and optimizing energy consumption of water systems. And he's going to be talking about that tool tonight. So uh, again, thank you all for coming and I'm going to turn it over to you for the presentation. Um, thank you very much, Michael and Patrick. Can everybody hear me? Okay, so. Uh, no. Okay, I guess oh, I have to uh, Quick thing, we, we are recording tonight's session, by the way. I wanted to let all the attendees know that. Sorry, Sean. That's okay. I have to. <laughs> Oops, that was me. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so, so um, thanks, everybody. I'm, I'm very excited about the presentation today and really excited about, um, about presenting with, with Derek and Brian, whom I've worked with on, on a number of things. Um, I am a landscape architect, as, as Michael just said, and I'm going to give a little bit of a soft presentation to issues um, relating generally um, pertaining to water and um, landscape architecture, but really more just kind of flying through a bunch of, a bunch of projects. And then 
then Brian will be kind of dig in deep on rainwater harvesting, and then Derek will um, kind of zoom in on the relationship between energy systems and water systems um, with his wet calculator, among other things. But one of the things I thought was kind of interesting about, to, about water and water in Boston is that so much of our land in Boston, as you can see from, from the map of the historic um, neck entry into Boston, really was created out of water. So not only is water sort of around us, it's fundamental, it's basically our, our very, very foundations um, within, within this, this city. Um, we, in this presentation, all of our, our contact information is here, but Michael, Michael gave a great, great introduction. Um, so, so when I was kind of thinking about this project and almost all of our work, sorry about the typo out here, uh, is within the city. And I, I was just glancing through Google and, and looked at what are, soft, what are the three effects of urbanization. And poor water quality was one, insufficient water availability, and high energy consumption, as, as well as waste disposal. So it is, and given the dramatic level of urbanization within our country, it's a, it's a pretty significant issue that it almost is all about the water. Um, so to, I wanted to, to talk about the context that we're working in to begin with. Um, we as landscape architects are working almost exclusively, we, my, uh, my firm ground, working almost exclusively in very urban conditions. Um, so this particular project, the, the Mass Art Treehouse, we were working on the landscape um, below. And, and the building was designed based on Gustav Klimt's Tree of Life. So, so we started you know, looking, well, what is at the base of a tree? And, and the idea came out of these mossy mounds being at, at the base of the tree. Um, and so we kind of you know, came up with this concept of these big sort of mounds. And, created what, you know, in some way sort of feels like this little urban oasis. But one of the things that I'm, you know, and, you know, lovely, but it isn't this sort of natural oasis. This is actually what it's sitting on. And in this case, this is actually three branches of, of the MWRA sewer system. So, so I think it's important to recognize that we're working in a highly constructed environment. Um, you know, this may be extreme, but, <laughs> but, but in, in, almost, in almost every instance. And still, as landscape architects, what we're trying to do is, is to, create, to create a piece of, a piece of a nature and, you know, recognize the seasonality. This, this is sort of fun because when we built this project, we didn't realize um, the effect that having these LED light planks would have with the snow above them because they give off so little heat that they don't melt the snow and it just becomes this kind of lantern glowing, glowing through it. The other project, and this isn't, you know, this is really just setting the context of the ground, not necessarily about the water, but what we're really, what we're really working in it in many cases. This is um, Tontine Crescent, downtown Boston, and this was uh, historic Charles Bullfinch um, crescent um, that has really ha fat or had really fattened into a big into a, a multi-lane roadway and parking and working with the city um, the idea was to really put the road on a diet and you know and claim this space for public space so um, this is a this is a temporary tactical project with the um, with the concept with the idea that this would be turned into a permanent project and you can see there you know using this sort of AutoCAD tree logos painted on, on the, the plan as kind of a harbinger of, of what you know what could really take place in the future um, so I'm sure a number of people have, have seen this already um, the plaza but now that we're at, our office is actually working on the permanent project and this is the web of utilities on top of what we're building so really like trying to think the real ground where is the real ground um, it's kind of a web because you, each of these things isn't really just a skinny little line um, so in in terms of designing a landscape um, we have to kind of go up 
and really build planters to build places for trees and planting. And in, in this particular case, actually, water is an issue in that we don't have any groundwater or any irrigation. So another place, um, you know, where thinking of, of the ground, the ground plane of what we're really working on. And, all, and you know, again, what I'm doing here is sort of setting the stage for some of the stuff that, that, um, that Derek and, and Brian are looking at. So that's why I'm sort of not going through things in any real detail. But this is, uh, you know, a 30,000, 35,000 square foot green roof on top of the Natick Mall. Um, that we constructed about 10 years ago. And, you know, and the idea was that it, it sort of looks graphically and beautiful from above, but also creates a highly textured um, landscape that, ha that has kind of the, 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 the nurturing, the biophilic, the restorative qualities of nature. Um, but again, an extremely um, constructed ground plane. And this kind of, um, you know, the layer of cake the layer cake of building up of what this what this looks like with the plan of the planters kind of built on top and then you know ultimately back to something that looks natural to, to a certain degree and of course the plants themselves are um, and you know many of the materials so now I wanted to talk about a couple of projects this was a project that we worked on again about 10 years ago um, and this is in the ground the um, groundwater conservation overlay district in in boston and as probably many of you know the groundwater in the in this district has been depleted so much that the that the piers um, are are drying up within this within the or had been drying up and so it's protect to both protect and the historic neighborhoods and the buildings, but also, you know, also a strategy to reduce stormwater runoff. So this kind of lovely little backyard garden, um, interestingly, it was almost all the material or reclaimed juice tanks. Um, but the whole surface underneath this planting, and I'll just sort of click through, through the, you know, the, these great beautiful boards, um, but is, was dug up and the and the re, the subsurface recharge beds put in really the only places that um, aren't a big recharge bed or are, are the place where the where the big ginkgo tree is um, this is collecting all of the roof runoff so you know now this is becoming pretty common but at, on a residential scale sort of 10 plus years ago it was it was a fairly heroic effort for a small little garden Another project that we worked on where we wanted to bring um, a little bit of more of a systems approach into the experience of the, um, of the students in the everyday was at the Collaborative Learning and Innovation Center at Tufts. Um, this was a, a project that we started with a parking lot. Um, this was the building prior, right at Harvard and Boston Ave. And when we got the brief, the project was still a parking lot in the front and a building renovation. And we went to, we had a very um, active charrette. We were working with, you know, with, um, with the Ad Inc, which was now the Stantec team, Michael's office. And um, we came to the, to the project charrette with a bunch of models, physical models. And, and we started off, we had one where we had the whole area as a parking lot. We had another where we had half of it as a parking lot and another where we had a third of it as the parking lot. And we left the meeting with, you know, with the, with the Tufts team extremely excited about getting rid of the parking entirely in the site, even though that was their brief and they would find it somewhere else. And, and turning this project into a little bit of a sustainability test garden for, or test project for them in the building as well as in the landscape. So this, so it went from this to, you know, to this. Um, and one of the aspects of it was this stepped rain garden that was collecting water from the, um, from the canopy and going into a series of bays that kind of filled, overflowed and filled in, into the, to the next one. Um, another aspect of it was the use of permeable paving. And because this wasn't a massively large project, 
the, um, the university was interested in testing some of the things that they hadn't used before, such as, such as porous paving. But we also had um, the requirements of the Medf Medford Fire Department. So we were able to kind of work this fire lane into the design of the plaza. And, um, you know, there's, there's the rain garden again, and, and really use porous paving throughout as well as not exclusively native, um, but, but, in, but, but adapt native and adapted species. And um, there's another little planting area in a different part where we were, where we used to test different native ground covers. Um, so just a few kind of diagrams of, you know, the sort of big picture idea of the, of making it, it isn't a significantly large rain garden, but, but it's making it very, um, a kind of a forefront component of the design, brings it as part of the dialogue of the project. Um, and then the, the permeable paving and then the, the textured planting. So in this other area where we were using in the other courtyard, some smaller areas of um, native ground covers to kind of test them to see if they would work. This was with full um, acceptance on Tuff's part that it might not fail, but they, it might not succeed. And, and that was okay because they, they were small enough that they could replace them with, with different plantings in, um, in the future. And since then, the Tuff Student Sustainability Group or Resilience Group has now um, taken this area, parts of this area at the back, and as well as this central garden to test the different pollinator species. So, so it's, it's really fantastic for us that this has become kind of a living, um, living test project for them. And then I think actually, I'm, I may even be ahead of myself in schedule here. Um, the other, only other thing that I wanted to talk about was, an, was about trees and our, an approach to the streetscape. Um, this is a project that we did downtown Boston. And we've, we wanted to kind of get away from the typical, you know, street tree and then like 30 feet down, other street tree surrounded by concrete and really bring, bring a more sort of vibrant planted um, experience to, to this street. This is... Um, this is Traveler Street in, in Boston. And so the idea of kind of capturing this one side as, as a buffer against the street and also as, as a large planting bed and then as well, you know, as well sort of planting on that side. And then kind of poking out a little bit into, into the street. So you get the, the experience of, you know, the, the landscape's kind of stretching out. Um, and this is more of an echo of the, these large tree grades that we have on the other side on top of a permeable paving. And, and this again is a project that was probably constructed about 10 years ago. So, um, you know, one of, one of, now this is becoming very standard within in the city, but it was one of the, the sort of beginning projects that the city was open to accepting. Um, and other than that, I just wanted to mention the, that, oh, that also actually the only, Thing, other thing I was talking about was that um, that the idea of of trying to protect the trees from compaction and give it the roots places to go with the use of either structural soil in, in this case or as, as a number of our projects in Somerville with with silva cells um, but I did want to mention and and this is why I started with the the highly constructed ground that we live in with this city is it isn't we aren't living in an entirely natural um, condition and if we want plants to thrive we have to give them what they need and in many cases and in a lot of cases they need water they need um, irrigation or supplemental water because in in not every case you know tree street trees many street street trees are, are this is an application where you know where trees can can thrive, but in, in a lot of other conditions, they, they can't um, very well where the plants can't. So, so we do work with Brian Benkezi and irrigation consulting a lot um, using, using very sort of sophisticated um, low water emitting irrigation systems. So I am now going to hand the, the presentation off to him um, and he can talk about, uh, 
about irrigation, but most specific, but more specifically about the rainwater harvesting strategies that he's work he is and has worked with. Great, thank you, Shana. So hopefully we can see my screen. Yes. Great. So I'm going to be pretty specific on rainwater harvesting in terms of irrigation. So um, as we know, many irrigation systems rely on potable water. Uh, potable water is not a good use of water for irrigation. I'm a firm believer that if you can avoid the use of potable water, you should do that. But there are advantages to using potable water. Is It's usually unlimited as long as you're willing to pay for it. It's a pressurized delivery, so you don't need any pumping. It has very good water quality, in some cases maybe too much because of the chlorine. It's usually reliable unless you're in a drought, and then it can become very unreliable very quickly. And it is relatively inexpensive. Um, it, it just doesn't cost very much. But as the green and the sustainable movements have become mainstream, alternative water sources for irrigation have become necessary or popular, um, depending on your perspective. So when you look at alternative water sources, you have groundwater, you have effluent water, which in Massachusetts is extremely difficult to use. Uh, gray water, which again in Massachusetts is difficult to use, but in other states very easy to use. Rainwater, which we'll be talking about mostly tonight. You can use storm water, but uh, treatment costs can be expensive. Same thing with salt water. Um, all of those can be used for irrigation depending on local and site regulations. But rainwater harvesting has become the most popular of them all, um, mostly due to lead requirements and green code requirements. So if you look at each state, some states are very progressive when it comes to rainwater harvesting. Arizona and Texas and Georgia, they've, they've been doing it for years. They all have manuals on rainwater harvesting in their states that date back to, to the 1990s. Uh, other states are very unprogressive in terms of rainwater harvesting. In Colorado, excuse me, Utah and parts of Washington, rainwater cannot be used for irrigation because they are what they call prior appropriation states, and they all have um, water rights, and those water rights belong to the downstream user, and the rain that fell on your property is supposed to run off so the downstream user can use it. So in some states, you can't even collect and use rainwater. Rainwater is usually dictated by code, um, the Uniform Plumbing Code and the International Plumbing Code, don't really address it that well. Most of the rainwater codes are the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical or the IAPMO code and the ICC code, depending on what state you are. They actually have competing standards for rainwater harvesting, which is very rare because the standard is usually in one organization of the other. But the one that is coming out now and taking the most control of rainwater harvesting and irrigation in general, and water reuse is the ASHRAE 189.1 standard, which uh, is also going to be part of LEED. You also have to look at your health code. So can you, uh, for instance, use pipe non-potable water through a building? So at the project that Shauna showed in uh, Natick on the Mall, the Natick Board of Health had a rule that no unpotable water cannot be pumped through a building. But they also had a rule that says potable water can't be used for irrigation. So it made it very difficult to come up to the roof because you don't have a water source. But they kind of reneged on that and let us pump it up through the roof. And then the EPA has a rec recreational water quality criteria that some states use, like the uh, Washington, D.C., in terms of what quality of water you need to have uh, for irrigation that you're going to spray or subsurface. Um, you see a lot of irrigation systems that are rainwater that used to have or have a three-way valve. So what that means is it, it has a valve on it that when there, there's water in the storage, you pump that into the irrigation system. And if you run out of water, this valve changes and the potable water goes directly into the irrigation system bypassing the, the storage. Uh, in the state of Massachusetts, you can't do that anymore. The uh, DEP doesn't like that. And then the other thing you always have to be concerned about is disinfection. And disinfection of the water is very jurisdictional. In Massachusetts, 
you do not have to disinfect rainwater before you spray it with irrigation. Um, some states like New York, Washington, DC, if you're going to spray it, you have to disinfect it. If you don't spray it and you use all subsurface, you don't have to disinfect it. That's important because disinfection is very expensive because it raises the filtration requirement, which is the expensive part of it. Um, and it also takes up a lot more room, but um, it all depends on the jurisdiction and the owner to an extent. So when you look at rainwater harvesting, a lot of people think it's just a rain barrel uh, and it's, you just collect it off the roof and you take it out of the rain barrel, which works great for a house. Uh, you, you know, these are 55 or 30 gallons. You collect the water when you want to water your garden, you, you open a spigot and you, you fill up a, a bucket and you go put it out. Or if you have a little bit of pressure, you can use gravity. But in most cases on a commercial type rainwater harvesting system, you're not going to get away with anything that's even close to this or the cost of this. So when you look at collecting, you have to do uh, quite a bit of math for rainwater harvesting. When you look at the roof, you don't really look at the pitch or the shape or the complexity of the roof. It's just how much water, how much surface area or roof are you collecting? And then you need to look at that versus the landscape. So if you've got a large landscaping and a small roof, rainwater harvesting is probably not going to do you much good. If you have a large roof and a small landscape, it's going to do you a lot of good, but that very, very rarely is the case. Usually it's somewhere in between. It's very rare that you're going to capture 100% of your irrigation needs through, through rainwater harvesting unless you put in a lot of storage. So when you're planning for rainwater harvesting, there's a number of things you have to look for. You have to look at the roof area, the rainfall data, Normally, you need to look at at least 25 years or so of historical rainfall data. Some people model uh, on a monthly basis. We like to model on a daily basis. Uh, it's a much more accurate way to model your rainwater. You have to look at your collection efficiencies off the roof, your evapotranspiration data from your plant material, what the plant is, what type of plants are going to be on there, what the irrigation efficiencies are going to be, those inputs all go into a model and you come up with a tank size that's going to be somewhat based on location, but it's going to give you an ideal tank size based on whether you're trying to hit a lead requirement or try to do all your irrigation water. And then it'll also tell you what your pumping requirements are going to be for that system. So here's a typical um, analysis. So when you look at lead, you're always going to look at July. Unless you're in Florida, you're going to look at April, but the, the, the EPA water budgeting tool, which everybody uses these days, requires you to look at the month of July, which in this case you can see is the worst water use. So you want to look at your, what's your irrigation demand going to be throughout the irrigation season. And in Massachusetts, it's going to be about 28 weeks or so, part of April through part of October. And it's going to vary based on the climate. So you're going to figure out the water use. In this case, this one is an average annual irrigation demand of 102,000 gallons, um, and it has its maximums and its minimums. So then from that, you're going to model it to come up with the tank size. So when we model, we model to hit a certain percentage, uh, usually looking at the lead requirement. So in this graph, if you look at that, and this is a small site, this is 50,000 square feet of roof area. And you, it says that for a minimum effective tank size to meet lead, you're going to be just over 30,000 gallons of storage needed. If you wanted to uh, set, offset 75% of the domestic water use over the 25-year period, the tank's going to have to be a little bigger at 40,000 gallons a minute. And what you do is you can see that if you look at the curved part of the graph, that on all modeling for rainwater, at some point, getting a bigger tank doesn't do you any good. So you always have to look at that point. Uh, there's a diminishing return after that. Now here's a much larger system, okay? And then this one, the, the tank size to meet lead is just over 300,000 gallons uh, of storage. And to meet the 75% would be about 550,000 gallons of storage. And if you wanted to offset all of your irrigation demand, you're all the way up to 
700,000 plus gallons of water. And you think, well, that's an awful lot of storage. But we have systems, uh, one in Massachusetts, that's 500,000 gallons of buried storage. And one in Washington, DC, which we'll see here in a minute, that's a million gallons of underground storage. So when you look at storage, the storage is gonna be based on the location, how big it needs to be, and how much it's going to cost. So we have some clients, Massport being one, uh, that bases their storage more on their budget than on what it, they need it to be. So they set aside a certain amount of money for their storage and the tank size then falls into place pretty easily, even though it may or may not meet the criteria. Um, you can have an above ground tank, you can have a below ground tank, you can incorporate a water feature as your storage. It all depends what you wanna do. There's many different types of storage. You can get a concrete, which is the least expensive. And the nice thing about concrete is it can be any shape you want. Uh, you can either buy that prefabricated or have it built into the foundation, which a lot of people do. Fiberglass tanks are, are pretty standard in size. You always have to worry about buoyancy with fiberglass tanks if they're gonna float. They're a little harder to work with, but you can, a lot of people use them. And then you can use plastic tanks. Those are usually gonna be above ground because they don't like to be buried. And the shape of those is somewhat limited. And if you look at littler systems, there's all sorts of specialty products out there for storage. Uh, there's bags, there's a uh, storm cell, there's a whole bunch of them. Keep in mind that not 100% of your storage is going to be usable. Um, it's usually gonna vary between that's a typo, 70 and 80% of what you store you're gonna be able to get at. And the amount of your storage that is usable is dependent on the storage, the shape, the storage size, and how you're pumping out of the storage. That's a very important in terms of how big the storage needs to be. You have to leave room for sediment because you're gonna get some settling in there. But storage is very expensive. It ranges from about $3.50 to $5 per gallon installed, depending on the type. So if you're gonna put in a 50,000 gallon tank, you're looking at about 200,000 gallons right off the bat. And that's not considered all that big a tank these days. So this is a underground storage going in. This is on the National Mall in Washington, DC. This is a 250,000 gallon tank. It, there are four of them installed on the mall under the lawn. Uh, we collect about a million square feet of stormwater runoff for irrigation there. And it supplies about 35% of the mall's irrigation needs. The other 65% comes from potable water. You can also do above ground storage. These are two 7,500 gallon um, storage tanks. This is over in uh, Watertown. They, nice thing about above ground storage is people can see it and you can use it as an educational aspect or um, a visual aspect if you want, but there, that's one way to do it. Um, when you do storage, these are fiberglass tanks. You can use single tanks of various sizes. Fiberglass comes in 10, 20, 30,000. They don't get much bigger than that because you can't truck them after that. You can use multiple tanks gang together or several remote tanks to collect more water. So sometimes the way your roof might be designed, you can't get all the water to one area. So you might have several tanks and then you pump from tank to tank to transfer the water to one larger tank. It's very expensive from a pumping standpoint, which we'll get into in a minute, but um, if you can transfer your water to one tank and pump out of that, you're gonna be better off. One pumping point is always gonna be less expensive and easier to manage. When you look at pumping, the pump systems can, be, can range from uh, very cheap to very expensive, very simple to very sophisticated. It all depends how you wanna handle it. Uh, the pump can be in the storage, which is submersible pumps, which are very popular. Uh, above the storage with the lift, which is less popular because you don't usually have the room for that. Or you can have it beside the storage, um, which we call a flooded suction. So the above ground tanks you saw, that is a flooded suction system where the mall is sort of a combination flooded suction um, gravity feed system. Uh, you wanna make sure you have service ability to manage the usable storage. Uh, 
if you lay a submersible pump in the in the bottom of the tank, you have to be very careful because the bearings aren't made for it. Um, the thing to remember that you want to try and keep whatever is in the storage relatively easy to work with because if something goes wrong, somebody may have to go into the tank. And that uh, isn't a lot of fun. Uh, a, it's a confined space, it has other issues also. Uh, suction lift is easier to maintain but doesn't maximize the storage and requires more space. So here's a simple uh, fiberglass tank. You can see there's a submersible pump in the bottom. You're just going to pipe pump out of that with a pipe. You've got a level sensor. Uh, you have to be very careful about levels in your, in your storage. And then it has a little cable on it and a quick disconnect so that if you had to pull the pump out, you could do that without sending somebody in. But in most cases, you're going to support somebody in. Your tank always needs to have two points of entry and access uh, because you want to make sure just somebody can get out if something goes wrong or another person can get in. This would be the top view. Again, the pump would just be in the tank. And then when you come out of the tank, you're going to have your other equipment, which is, so if this is a berry tank, you're going to have a, a lot of equipment just outside the tank. You're going to have your, your filtering, your metering, uh, your valving, all of that um, is going to be right outside the tank. So you're going to have a number of valve boxes that grade that you need to think about aesthetically. So this is an inside um, flooded section. This comes off the um, two storage tanks. This is a relatively sophisticated system because it has disinfection and the disinfection requires a high degree of filtration. It has a city water makeup supply that's automatic with an ear gap, as you can see here on the left, which is all automated. So it takes up quite a bit of room. So you need to, if this is going in a building or in a basement, you have to make sure you've allocated enough space to that and the coordination. So when you look at the controls for rainwater harvesting, uh, they're the brains of the system and there needs to be a lot of logic. And the logic, unfortunately, is expensive. Um, expensive. It's very important to monitor and control your input and outputs of what's going on in the storage and in the irrigation system you're feeding. So it requires a lot of logic. Mechanical logic can work, but programmable logic is the best, uh, especially if your system is large. Your pumps can go on and off simply with a pump start relay from an irrigation system, which you might have seen before, but it's best to have a variable frequency drive, a flow sensor, and a pressure transducer should be used. So one of the things in the green codes these days, both the IATMO and the ICC code and LEED to an extent is, they want you to meter all water use. So um, putting in a flow sensor, flow meter in a rainwater harvesting system is pretty much becoming just a necessity. You don't have the option of not doing it. Keeping track of the amount of water you're pumping and how much water you're adding is also a good idea. So as we always say, the more I know about my water, the more I can manage it. So if I'm not metering it, I have a hard time managing it. So if I can manage how much water is going in, how much water is going out and meter all that, I know what's going on. And then you have to keep track of your water level. You wanna make sure that the water level in the, in the storage doesn't get too high and that it doesn't get too low. So here's a little simple system. That's the control panel on the left. There's two drives on here for two pumps. But you can track the levels in the storage usually with one probe um, that looks at number of different levels in the cistern or the storage. Because uh, you're going to have to have one for pump off if the water gets too low, transfer pumps on if the water gets too low, a uh, high level if it gets too high, and when and when not to turn up, turn on the makeup water. So let's talk about makeup water for a minute. So with most rainwater systems, uh, you need the water the most when it's raining the least. So if it was raining, the tank would be full, but you wouldn't need to irrigate. When you need to irrigate, it's been dry, and there's probably not necessarily a lot of water in the tank, um, unless you've put in a really big tank system. So uh, large tanks are expensive. The percent of time the storage will need to be, will not, 
The percent of time the storage will not be able to meet the irrigation needs can be calculated based on the climate analysis as we saw in the chart. So you can give an owner different tank size options and tell them what percentage of water over the year will be supplied or not, and they can make an economical decision on how much money they want to spend on the storage. Um, so the makeup can be a groundwater source, it could be a cooling water source, uh, it could be a potable source, and you would automate that even if you have different makeup water sources so that they all come on at different levels. So for example, uh, you could have the transfer water come on first. When you run out of transfer water, you could back it up with groundwater. And when you run out of groundwater, you could back it up with potable water. And you could set all of that in your logic hierarchy if you wanted to. Um, if you use potable water, you need to use a proper backflow preventer and an air gap, depending on the storage design in the local jurisdiction. So it used to be, and a lot of people, they just put a backflow in and then dump the potable water right into the tank. Uh, a lot of the municipalities now are requiring that in addition to the backflow, you still have a air gap to put the water into the tank. And that makes things a little more difficult, especially with a buried tank, uh, because the air gap is hard to do. These systems are very expensive. Their payback is usually horrible. The payback on the National Mall system we did, that's about four years old when we finally finished it, had 123 year payback. So this is a little uh, system in Watertown. And if you look here, this has um, about a 37 year payback. And it's very expensive. It's uh, the 20, 25 year cost is $229,000. And you're paying about $45,000 extra to meet the lead requirement. But you can see the overall system over 25 years uh, is up into the $300,000 range. The cost of water is what dictates your payback, but that's the cost of potable water. And potable water just isn't that expensive, especially in most places. It's a little more expensive in Boston, but still, uh, you're not gonna do rainwater harvesting based on the payback analysis. It's going to take uh, you wanting to do so something, the owner wanting to do something sustainable or trying to get the lead point. Uh, and in this, in, in, in lead four, it's only one point. Um, keep in mind that along with rainwater harvesting, you need a properly designed irrigation system is very important. The irrigation efficiency and the uniformity have a direct effect on the storage requirement. The more efficient you can be with the irrigation, the less storage you're going to need. So usually you're going to have a weather-based or soil moisture-based control system that will increase your overall irrigation system efficiency so you can keep your tank size low. Rainwater harvesting systems require a great deal of coordination and the coordination has to be done early because you have to look at your roof leaders, your drainage, your tank size, your tank location, what the power needs are going to be, where the controls are going to be, how it's going to be monitored, is it going to be part of the building management system or that sort of thing. Uh, it requires a high level of design detail. Uh, you have to decide who's doing what between the mechanical, the civil, and the irrigation person, and the electrical engineer. Um, because of that, rainwater systems that are large, other than a rain barrel, don't really lend themselves to design build scenarios. Um, that's a good way to, to get into trouble. But these things can get relatively sophisticated. So this is the Clark Art Museum out in, um, I forget where it is, out in Western Massachusetts on the very Northwest corner um, where Williams College is. And this system looks at reusing water from a cooling standpoint, from a, uh, a water feature standpoint, from an irrigation standpoint, it uses under drainage water, it uses storm water, it uses groundwater, it uses potable water, it does toilet flushing, it does irrigation, it does water feature filling. And as you can see, this makes it a very sophisticated system that all has to be engineered and thought out way ahead of time in order to be as efficient 
as possible with the water and to reuse as much water on site as possible. And with that, we will move on to Derek. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Let me just find the share screen option. Here we go. Great. So uh, taking off from where Brian left off there, I'm going to, again, be talking a little bit more about rainwater harvesting as well as gray water recycling um, with a little different angle, going to really be focusing on the energy consumption of those systems. Uh, so going to start out with a little background info on just the connection between water and energy to set up the conversation about how we actually go about assessing the energy consumption of our water systems. And by water systems, I'm talking on-site water systems of rainwater harvesting and gray water recycling primarily, as well as our uh, municipal supplies. Then we'll talk a little bit about, uh, we'll, we'll talk into some case studies using the water energy tool or WET that um, we've developed at Arup with some of our internal uh, research and development programs and a couple projects that we've applied that, that tool on to assess the energy consumption of rainwater harvesting or gray water recycling so that we can compare it to using the municipal supply and see how we stack up in terms of saving both water and energy. And then finally, we'll wrap up with some selection criteria in terms of when I think we should recommend rainwater harvesting and gray water recycling systems or, or not. So first I'll touch on the connection between water and energy. So how does water consume energy? Um, a significant amount of energy is required to move the water from its source to our buildings and sites. And additionally, some sources of water require energy to pump the water from the ground or to treat it to potable water standards. Uh, so this picture here is the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which is carrying water from the Owens River nearly 300 miles to Los Angeles. So just think about the amount of energy required to pump all that water. Uh, and generating energy also consumes water. So that kind of creates a bit of a water energy feedback loop. Uh, and the reasons why, uh, you know, our thermoelectric systems evaporate sorry, sorry, water. Sorry, Derek, sorry to interrupt. We can't see your screen. Oh, no kidding. I apologize for that. <laughs> I thought I put that up there. Hang on. How's, how's that? Can you see the screen now? Um, we can we can see it now, although it's in sort of slide preview mode. Yeah, let me let me restart that. It bounced out there. I apologize for that. And then uh, uh, I'm going to just chime in for folks also and say, if you have questions as we go, please type them into the chat window, and we will respond to them at the end of the presentation. Yes, thank you. Um, so anyway, these are the four points we'll be talking on. So background info, assessing energy and consumption of our water systems, go through a few key studies, and then wrap up with selection criteria on when we should be recommending rainwater harvesting and gray water recycling. Uh, so jumping back into where we were at, our water systems consume energy and our energy systems consume water. Uh, so you know, why do energy systems consume water? It's, uh, you know, our thermoelectric systems evaporate water. Um, at during their cooling process and our hydroelectric systems evaporate water off the surface of reservoirs. So actually 90% of the United States electricity system, electricity is generated by those two systems. <clears throat> Just to provide an example of what that connection means, if you leave one conventional 60 watt light bulb on for uh, eight hours, you just evaporated a gallon of water somewhere. Uh, so we, while we can save water on site by providing water efficient fixtures, uh, we can also save a significant amount of water offsite simply by reducing our energy. So if we want to save energy, we have to save water. And if we want to save water, we have to save energy. You really can't do one without the other. So if we should reduce our water to save both water and energy, you're probably asking the question, why, do we, why should anybody bother calculating the energy that we're using when we're saving water, such as by using rainwater harvesting or gray water recycling? And I would suggest that it's actually quite useful to compare the energy embodied in our municipal water and sewer systems against the energy that we're using when we are collecting water on site. Um, as Brian mentioned, there's a lot of, there, there can be a fair bit of energy that goes into these systems on site. When we store it in a tank, we pump it up to a filter system, we use some dis different treatment systems and so on. Uh, and there's, there's energy in, in that use as well. Now, in some cases, that on-site energy use can actually be higher 
than the energy embodied in our municipal systems. So one common case I found is that rainwater harvesting systems supplying a small percentage of a project's water demand will sometimes consume more energy than the municipal system. And I'll provide an example of that in a case study in a little bit. Uh, so if we calculate the energy consumption of the on-site water system, we can identify that kind of scenario. And we can also identify alternative designs that allow us to save both water and energy. Often a small expansion of a small rainwater harvesting system can start to take advantages, advantages of economies of scale, resulting in lower energy consumption than using the municipal water supply. So that brings us to our second topic for today, which is how can we assess the energy consumption of our water systems? So to do this, we need to quantify the energy consumed at every stage of the water cycle, specifically the energy used to treat, uh, obtain the water from its source and bring it to a treatment system of some sort, treat it to often to, to potable water quality standards, and then distribute it to our sites. Uh, once we're at the site, we then need to think about any on-site pumping or treatment requirements there, as well as if we have any on-site wastewater uh, treatment systems, what's the energy associated with those? Again, often pumps are associated with those types of systems. And then finally, uh, in areas especially served by combined sewers, the, we, it's important to think about the energy used to then pump and treat that wastewater and stormwater uh, from our sites to these uh, off-site sewage treatment plants. So I'll talk about the first four bits of that water life cycle um, first here. So the energy consumption required to collect, treat, and distribute that water really does vary based on your region's water portfolio. And so a lot of it comes down to where you're getting your water. You know, desalinization and importing your water from far distances can have quite a high ener embodied energy in those water supplies. Whereas if you get your water from a local supply, which is more typical here in Massachusetts with a lot of streams and reservoirs available to us, um, your energy consumption can be a lot lower. Now, I'm sure you're starting to say, yeah, that's, that's great and all, but how am I gonna figure that out? Well, uh, fortunately, the uh, regional energy consumption values are published by the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, in their water and sustainability report. So you can go there and get some good proxies for the embodied energy in our water systems for your, uh, for your regions. We can also get more specific local water system information. For example, the MWRA publishes much of their energy consumption data on their website, and you can just pick up the phone or send an email to a, a water department, and oftentimes they will be pretty responsive in terms of getting that data to you. I've yet to find a water system that I haven't been able to find the energy consumption of those systems. So for the next bit in the life cycle, our on-site or, or end use, some of the uh, typical components that consume energy, as I mentioned, your pumping systems, uh, your water treatment systems. So if we're talking about, you know, whether it's rainwater harvesting or gray water recycling, if you have a, 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 a membrane bioreactor system out there or reverse osmosis uh, on your, your water treatment side, if you're doing wastewater treatment, you may have a, you know, various different types of, of wastewater treatment systems out there. Ultraviolet is a pretty common uh, system for treating water. Uh, and, and those systems, actually, those lights generally need to run 24 seven or, or pretty close to it because they need to be operational when on demand and it takes a while for those lights to warm up. So that's a, a bit of an energy demand as well. Uh, once again, EPRI comes through with us with uh, some typical energy consumption values for those types of on-site treatment systems in their water and sustainability publications. Some of those systems, if you want to be specific about your site, you are going to need to calculate them. Now, generally, as we get into our design, our engineers, you know, at Arup, we're for, I'm fortunate. I, I, we've got mechanical and electrical and plumbing engineers all in our office, so I can go bug those guys and just get that data directly out of them for our projects. Or, uh, you know, for the site stuff, I, I'm generally calculating, um, you know, the horsepower of pumps and so on. So we can, we can calculate those things for our sites, or we can use typical values if you want to be a little quicker about it. Then the last stage uh, to really think about in the energy use is offsite wastewater treatment. So this is again, particularly relevant in areas with combined sewers as 
uh, you know, when we're collecting water, especially with rainwater harvesting, if we're collecting that rainwater, we are reducing the runoff from the site. So we can take a credit for that reduction in the energy used by the municipal sewer system. If we're saying, hey, we're collecting that water and that's no longer going to the treatment plant. And uh, high level analysis, once again, can be performed using regional values. Uh, but I, again, I really have yet to find a site where I'm not able to dig up specific data from wastewater treatment facilities uh, serving our, our sites so that I can document the actual energy consumption for the system. So in estimating and calculating those energy demands, and you, you calculate it for each step, add them up, um, and the, uh, you know, from source to site to wastewater treatment facility, you're then able to estimate the full life cycle energy consumption of your water system. And then calculating your carbon footprint is a pretty simple matter of converting the energy um, to pounds carbon dioxide based on the energy portfolio of the system supplying the electricity to the site. You can see, you know, pounds uh, of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. A nice little metric here published by the River Network Water and Energy Program in their water energy toolkit. So that's a high level how to, um, you know, as I mentioned, we've developed, I, I've developed uh, at Arup a water energy tool that, or WET, which allows us to kind of streamline that process. And like I said, I've got a number of, you know, we, we've got a, a, a large group of multidisciplinary engineers, which are, I'm able to bug and get some data for, and some great clients that get really excited about this stuff as well. I'm gonna give a couple, just two quick, quick case studies that I find particularly interesting in terms of the outputs here. I'm gonna talk about a rainwater harvesting project in Cambridge, Mass, and then a Smith College project that I actually worked on with Shauna uh, at Ground Inc. A, a few years back. So for our Cambridge, Mass, site. Uh, it's a half an acre site, relatively urban part of the city. This circle here is not where the project is. I apologize it's uh, for confidentiality reasons, but I promise it's a real project and, it, and the, uh, the actual location is, is effectively identical to this. Uh, so Cambridge's water system is, is a local system. They use reservoirs. Um, they have the option to tap into MWRA system, but they generally don't use it. So it's, it's fed by gravity from surface water. They have their own water treatment plant at Fresh Pond. Uh, and they actually manage to have enough pressure in that system because of the natural elevation of the city that they don't use any pumps to pressurize their water system. So Cambridge is, is very fortunate in their planning and in, in, in their location to have a water system with very low embodied energy. Um, this particular part of Cambridge, the project is on a separate sanitary sewer, so we're not sending storm water out to a combined sewer overflow uh, or anything like that, and it ultimately goes down to Deer Island um, for their treatment facility, which again, being as large as it is, takes a really good advantage of economies of scale in terms of the energy of the wastewater system. Uh, and MWRA also does a great job of, in, uh, of putting in a lot of renewable energy systems and energy efficient systems. So the water supply and the sewer systems are both very energy efficient for this particular community. So how does it stack up? Okay, a couple graphs here. I'll walk you through it. Uh, these are some of the outputs from our wet tool. Uh, you can see as we, oh, let me actually back up just one slide. So what we're doing on this first scenario, just two scenarios for the site, we're, we're looking at rainwater harvesting to supply a hundred. watching a webinar. Uh, so uh, sorry if somebody can go on mute there for just a moment. So we're looking at supplying 100% of our interior planting features irrigation demand from rainwater harvesting. So inside the building, we have a green wall and some, some planting features. So relatively small um, system here we're talking about. So running the numbers, what we see here on the top left is annual energy consumption. Our rainwater harvesting supply for those interior uh, landscape features, the energy consumption is shown here under this blue, uh, this blue bar. If we were to obtain that same amount of water from municipal supply, you could see there'd be a slight reduction in energy. So this system, this very small rainwater harvesting system is actually using more energy to provide that water demand than if we just pulled off the municipal supply. There are some other potential benefits though. You can see we are reducing our draw on the water system for the city and we're reducing our runoff from the site because we're collecting that water. Um, however, as I, Cambridge really isn't in an area of any water scarcity. So it's, you know, 
thinking through what's the benefit of, of, draw, of reducing that water supply when they are very, you know, it's very clean water, it's very resilient, they have the ability to tap into MWRA system, so it's fairly redundant. Somewhat questionable, it's maybe valuable, but something worth pondering. Do we wanna, do we wanna is this benefit worth increasing our carbon footprint? Uh, that runoff from the site, Maybe that's a good reason why and I'll talk about that again in a moment. But first I wanna talk about this graph here. Uh, just looking at our water supply, which really here is our rainwater captured versus our water demand. You can see by month that line's flat again because it's interior, so it doesn't really fluctuate by season. You can see there's a gap between those, which means we could have actually increased how much uh, how, you know, our, our water demand that's being fed from rainwater harvesting. So I thought, hey, let's try to do that and see if we can pick up some economies of scale here. Maybe if we make our system bigger, we can flip these and make this an energy saver as well as a water saver. So that's what we do in our next scenario here. We really tried to maximize our rainwater harvesting system. We're looking at providing 100% of our water supply for those interior uh, planting features and now also some exterior, all of our exterior site landscaping. So you can see here, uh, unfortunately, just making it bigger didn't do the trick. Uh, our, our supply, when we're getting that water supply from rainwater harvesting, we're still using more energy than you know, municipal supply. Um, you, know, you can see we have zeroed out our demand on the water system, which is great, uh, and we have significantly reduced discharge from the site. But uh, we just didn't achieve those economies of scale we were hoping for. And we've really, at this point, you can see our, our demand and supply lines are pretty well matched. We've about maxed this out on this small half acre site. There's not much more we can really do. Uh, so this is really what got me thinking. Does it really make sense to do this, right? If we're in a system where the city has a good quality water supply, good redundancy, really not much threat of, of losing that water supply, uh, what's, what's the benefit? And the only thing I could really think of that made a lot of sense is, okay, we're reducing our stormwater discharge from the site. Maybe we're, um, maybe we're helping a downstream flooding issue, but in this particular location, separate storm sewer, we're not impacting a combined sewer, and the water goes straight out to the Charles River, and the city has not identified any areas of flooding downstream of the project here. So really, I struggled to find a good reason to do this rainwater harvesting at this particular site. So I, I found that to be quite interesting. For our next case study, I'll walk through just a few scenarios for our Smith College Cutter and Ziskind Houses renovation project. Again, this was a, a really cool project that uh, Sean and I collaborated on. I love this picture uh, personally because it shows our, our green roof up there and this really nice courtyard uh, for, the, for the folks who are living in the dorms here over at Smith College. So this is a bigger site, about two and a half acres, uh, and the water and sewer systems are quite different than in Cambridge. Here, the city of Northampton has a, they do use reservoirs and surface water, but they also pull water from groundwater using some pumps. So they've got more energy in getting that water out of the ground. They also operate their own water treatment plant, but here they have two water pump systems in the stations in the city to pressurize their pipe network. So there's a lot more energy used to get the water to this site than in Cambridge. Uh, again, we're in a separate sanitary sewer area, so there's no issue with combined sewer overflows leaving the site. But the water, the wastewater here goes to the, the city's wastewater treatment plant, which of course is going to be much smaller than Deer Island and is not going to have those efficiencies of scale. So there's higher embodied energy in both the water and the sewer system for Northampton. Our first scenario here, we're going to run through four scenarios relatively quickly. Our first scenario, you know, I looked at, all right, what do we do, what happens if we are using rainwater harvesting to irrigate this courtyard area shown in blue? We're just reducing our, our water draw off the city by 10%. So we're not trying to hit lead or anything like that. We're just trying to do something good. Now, similar to Cambridge in those first scenarios, this system, a small rainwater harvesting system serving just 10% of the water supply is increasing our, our energy demand. Um, it does, uh, so again, really kind of big in the question, like are those benefits really worth the increase in greenhouse gases? And would it be more sustainable to just take that water we collect and infiltrate it on the site and not have that energy demand, still just bring that water back into its, into its aquifer? Um, which by the way, we did do that and we installed some bioretention systems on the site to keep that water on site. But kind of detracting from the point of this, this conversation, you can see here, we've increased our energy consumption that equates to about 380 pounds of carbon dioxide 
extra every single year compared to drying off the municipal water supply. So I said, okay, maybe here we've got a bigger area. Maybe we can hit some economies of scale. Let's go for 30% water reduction, provide rainwater harvesting for the front yard landscape irrigation as well. What do we get there? Now we're, now we're talking. Now we can start to see, all right, we've hit those, we're starting to hit those efficiencies of scale with our onsite pumping and treatment systems. Now we're doing better than the municipal supply for our energy consumption. We've got a system that saves water and saves energy. We also reduce our demand on the water supply and we reduce our um, water discharge, our stormwater runoff from the site so we can benefit downstream areas impacted by flooding. This is a win-win for energy and water. This is the kind of stuff you can really only do if you're looking at these numbers. Uh, so we're now actually reducing our carbon footprint by almost 500 pounds of carbon dioxide every year. Going a little further, we thought about, we were looking at um, gray water recycling. So now we're using gray water recycling plus rainwater harvesting. We're expanding the outdoor water reduction to include the green roof. And we're looking at uh, reducing our indoor water use by 20%. We're hitting two lead credits, doing a lot of great stuff. And again, even with the extra energy use of, that, of now having a, a membrane bioreactor in the UV system, we're still saving energy compared to the water supply system. So you might say, hey, all right, this makes sense. As long as we've got a relatively good size rainwater harvesting system and supply, we're gonna save energy and we don't need to calculate this stuff. Well, in comes the dreaded value engineering phase. And the client says, we don't have the money for all this right now. We can probably get to it down the line, but let's, let's cut some of this out. We still wanna hit our lead, you know, our, our lead rating of, of where we're at. So what can we do? Well, if we reduce, if we eliminate the rainwater harvesting system and just use the MBR, we only lose one lead credit, still maintain our lead rating. Seems like this is still a good sustainable project, right? Well, how do you have the conversation about what the impact there is if you're only talking lead credits? Because when we run the numbers, this scenario, we're now down to a relatively small treatment system. We're now increasing our energy consumption compared to just taking that water off the municipal supply. Now there's still benefits here. We're still reducing our demand on the water supply system, but now we've got the numbers. We can tell our client, you're gonna increase your carbon footprint by a thousand pounds of carbon dioxide compared to pulling this off the municipal supply. Maybe it's not an impact for lead, but this is a good conversation to have. So your client's at least informed about what the real issues are here. And you can have that conversation about does it make sense to increase your, your carbon footprint to reduce your water footprint? Which brings us to the final bit of, of my little chat here, talking about selection criteria. Uh, so this, these next few slides are really my attempt to define the selection criteria we should be considering uh, before recommending rainwater harvesting or gray water recycling. So we've got capital and operational costs, as Brian mentioned, uh, sometimes they're a little bit tough, uh, but sometimes you may be able to have a reasonable payback for a client to make that initial investment a no-brainer. There's also regional economy question issues that may, may be worth considering. Many towns have actually suffered to bring in businesses and, and su to provide sufficient housing development to prosper due to poor or unreliable water quality, even here in Massachusetts. Uh, in fact, both Brockton and Swansea have both struggled enough with poor water quality issues to actually build their own desalinization plants right here in Mass, um, which may surprise some folks. We've also got quality of life issues, improved water quality uh, can provide sufficient health, uh, significant health benefits. We've got educational benefits in terms of rainwater harvesting and gray water cycling systems can be set up to educate students, like, again, as Brian showed an example of, and, and or can educate the public about the function and benefits of sustainable water and energy systems. These can be good reasons to introduce these systems. Uh, as I noted, if you can reduce your carbon emissions, that's a great idea. If you can't, it's probably worth having a conversation about, is that carbon cost worth it? You've got flooding issues to consider, life safety issues associated with extreme rainfall events, as well as sewer overflows. And then finally, water availability and quality. And this is kind of a big one. This is really, in my mind, one of the big ones of, of what it comes down to. So I'm gonna to touch on this a little bit in just two more slides here. So to dig into water availability a little more, uh, the maps here on the left indicate the areas of historic water stress. So for context, water stress index greater than one means you're in an area where demand exceeds supply. 
So the top left map shows areas that experience water stress fairly regularly. Bottom left shows areas that experience it just occasionally. And the map on the right shows a forecast for how much these conditions are likely to change given the current climate trends. So you can see there are lots of communities, particularly out west, where it probably makes sense for rainwater harvesting and graywater recycling, even if it requires increasing your energy consumption. But in the Midwest, here in Massachusetts, um, we, we, we're really not experiencing water stress. It's not likely to happen in the near future, right? But water stress isn't the only critical factor. There's lots of uh, areas that may be considered water rich, uh, but their water is of such poor quality, uh, such as because of pollution or over withdrawal causing salt and water intrusion, like on the Cape, uh, that uh, you know, reducing our runoff from the site can help with that water quality benefit. And that's a, a quite an important aspect, right? But again, one size really doesn't fit all. And the issue of water quality is more nuanced when you get down to the granularity of individual communities. So for example, while Swansea and Brockton and other areas of Mass have struggled with water quality, much of the greater Boston area is served by the MWRA, which provides really clean, reliable, low energy water supplies. The Wachusett and the Quabbin Reservoirs were the, actually the largest man-made reservoirs in the world when they were completed. So they provide very deep, which is very important for climate change, they provide very deep reservoirs and a resilient source of clean water. They provide that water all the way out to Boston actually without the use of any pumps except in their, uh, in their re redundancy systems. So the energy, the energy there is very low to get that water to Boston. There's also a number of state agencies managing the watershed with buffer lands to protect it from these areas from development, uh, careful distribution of vegetation and active wildlife management to limit the impacts on the water quality. So the quality is so good that American Water Works Association recently actually named Boston Water and Sewer and MWA the top two winners of the national best of best tap water taste test. Um, and then on the back end uh, at Deer Island, MWRA has introduced multiple renewable energy generation and efficiency programs, further reducing embodied energy in their wastewater system. So what this all means is the MWRA system is very resilient to climate change. It provides clean water with extremely low embodied energy. We've also got a number of, the, number of other systems in Massachusetts that do a pretty good job as in Cambridge as well. So I put this, table together to try to simplify it into one slide uh, basically asking you know putting putting it all down in terms of when should we recommend rainwater harvesting and gray water recycling so if you can't check any of these boxes i really think it's worth having that conversation with your client and asking why why are we increasing our carbon footprint to get water directly from our site on cambridge nothing we did checked any of these boxes we had a good municipal supply, good quality, reliable water, redundant supply with the MWRA potential connection. We're not in an area of water stress. We're not reducing flooding. We're not reducing sewer overflows. We're not impacting its environmentally sensitive area. We're increasing carbon emissions. We're not improving quality of life um, or educational opportunities in a way that couldn't be provided with the municipal supply. And we're not Oh, that's questionable. I mean, green, green, and for you know, plants in general do provide some quality of life, but again, it could be provided with the municipal supply. And uh, as Brian demonstrated, you know, some of those capital costs were quite high. So this is where I just really struggled to say why are we doing this, guys? And I did actually recommend against installing that rainwater harvesting system uh, for Smith College. Uh, some scenarios did increase our carbon footprint, but by crunching the numbers, we were able to identify good strategies that reduced both water and energy. And that's really what I'm getting at here is being able to inform our clients. I really think it's our responsibility as engineers, architects, and planners to be informed about the real impacts of our designs. And I get the desire to want to implement systems that are considered sustainable um, everywhere we can. And I understand the drive to, to get those lead credits. But if we ignore the interdependencies of water and energy, then we're not giving our clients the opportunity to really develop holistic and sustainable sites. So by assessing the energy impacts of these water systems, we can optimize both water and energy savings, or at least be sufficiently informed to propose water systems that truly provide the best sustainable solution for the site. So with that, I just wanna wrap it up with a question. Uh, many of the areas on the map are still green indicating little or no water scarcity. 
is increasing greenhouse gas emissions to harvest water or recycle water really holistic and sustainable in these areas? Um, there may be some reasons to do it, but it's, it's worth the, the conversation. There's a lot of data out there about energy consumption in our water systems, but right now it's not really being used in our industry to inform decision making. And that's something I hope we can help change. So that wraps it up for us. Uh, I do appreciate uh, everybody joining us tonight. And uh, Michael or anybody, I don't know if there was anything else anyone wanted to jump in at the end before we open it up to questions. Yeah. Well, I would like to open it up to questions actually because we're, it's 20 after seven. And I, I think a priority is trying to address the questions that we've got. If we get through those, I might have a couple questions. Um, but why don't we, I don't, if you look at your chat, um, Brian, Derek, and Sean, um, we have four or five questions already, but some of them are pretty detailed, but let's just go to the top and knock those off first. I think those first ones are for you, Brian, uh, begin with how they even have standing regarding irrigation. Well, that's a really interesting comment because we asked the same thing. I mean, why is the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers um, weighing in? But they've weighed in big time. They're even in their standards go include cemeteries and golf. Um, they're a big, big 900 pound gorilla. They carry a lot of weight in the standards business and uh, they throw that weight around very specifically. Um, next question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the effect of storage size and the management of the cistern with regard to number of wet days, intensity of precipitation, variation on demand, including your point about when it's wet versus when it's dry? Or do you just determine that based on available precipitation and total demand? Well, you have to have a good model and you have to have good data. Uh, the data is actually not that hard to get. Um, Cornell Northeast, um, Cornell has a Northeast um, weather area that collects everything in the Northeast. You can get data from them relatively easily. And again, it, if you do it on a daily basis, it, it, it's much more accurate. But it just, if you run the numbers, it tells you what you need to do. And then you pick what percentage on an average that you want to be able to supply from your cistern system. And then you have to compare that to how much money you want to spend. Because again, the storage is expensive. You, could, you can build storage that'll get you through the whole year. You probably don't want to pay for storage that'll get you through. Great, Brian, that's helpful. And if we only answer part of your question, we don't really nail it, go ahead and keep, keep coming at us in the chat. Um, but I'm going to move on uh, I believe these questions are for you, Derek. Um, in the Cambridge, and I hope you can see them yourself, but I'll read it out. In the Cambridge scenario, what if the state itself decentralized systems, assuming demand will increase over time? Would there be a case for the city to create a decentralized system and pay for, and pay for or assist with individual systems? I think that's a great question, and, and I would absolutely advocate for that. Um, Denver has set up what they call a purple pipe system. So in, in part of the city there, they actually have their domestic water, um, uh, you know, in your typical black pipes, they install literal, literal purple pipes to make sure that people don't screw them up and, and, you know, connect into the wrong one where they use recycled water or collected water that is not treated to a potable standard. And then they pipe that to different uh, different users. Uh, there's a museum in Denver that I know has tapped into that system along with a, with a number of others. Uh, in some cases, there's not a um, uh, an economic case for it, but it, for MWR for Cam uh, Cambridge, their local water supply is actually not great for a. Uh, you know, for climate change, they're not nearly as deep as say the MWRA system and they do occasionally have to tap into MWRA system. They're fortunate to have that available to them, but MWRA doesn't do it for free. Um, they charge the, the city quite a bit when, whenever they draw that water off. So there could be an economic case for the city of Cambridge to make to installing a purple pipe type system and, and collecting water 
and storing it and then pumping it back to their um, to the end users. Uh, and I would suggest, you know, we've seen economies at scale, you know, when we're providing 30% of our, our water use on a two and a half acre site. Obviously, if the city of Cambridge does it, I would think you would be, they'd be able to provide a, a very efficient, energy efficient and water efficient system. Uh, so I think that's a great question and, and certainly a, a quite a good idea. And it would streamline, obviously, permitting. Um, mm -hmm. you know, to, all these decentralized systems have challenges of getting permitted for their various strategies. We heard in our last session, actually, um, about Design Lab's Hitchcock Center. And Brian, you'll be interested to hear this. They actually um, permitted it as a reservoir. <laughs> they, they outlined the catchment area and defined it as a reservoir. And that was their most direct path to the rainwater reuse system at the Hitchcock Center, which was pretty innovative, but also pretty, um, I don't know, um, extreme, I guess, at least it sounds it. So last question that we have uh, typed in here so far goes to, I think it was part of Derek's presentation. So is most energy used just for sanitizing the rainwater? Am I missing something? For landscape irrigation, do all Massachusetts municipalities require potable? Reclaim water criteria would be easier. Rainwater quality can't be that bad. Right, so a lot of it depends on what you're doing. Um, one of the things that I love to do with rainwater harvesting that requires no energy is to take the water from our, our storm sewer systems uh, and pipe them by gravity to street trees or, or landscape areas so that the water first goes by a low pipe down directly into the root systems of these, of these uh, planting beds, right? So that your water just goes there first and it's only when you have a big storm event that the water rises up, hits an overflow pipe and goes into your storm sewer. So by doing that, you can collect water and send it there. You can do that because it's all below ground. There's no potential for human contact. Now, if you're using spray irrigation or you have a water feature and there's potential for human contact, now you need to start treating that. And if you're using it, um, you know, if there's, if you wanted to drink from it, that would be obviously a much higher water standard. So it, there's varying levels of treatment required. And those treatments, you know, there's different filtration systems that all require a certain amount of pressure. So you got to put in pumps that push that through the filter systems. You've got, like I mentioned, UV lights in a lot of these cases that are running. So depending on what water quality standard you're trying to hit and what the source of your water is, you're going to have different treatment requirements and then different energy requirements. I think a lot of the energy is, is actually baked into the pumping systems associated with the treatment systems. Um, Brian, I don't know if you have anything to, to no, add in terms I, of that. I agree. I mean, it's all in the level of treatment and disinfection is probably the worst because it also increases the amount of filtration needed for the disinfection to be accurate, uh, worthwhile. And then that causes even more energy because you have to go through a higher pressure. Um, in terms of, not all Massachusetts municipalities require potable water. There are a number of municipalities in Massachusetts that do not allow potable water use for irrigation. And there's a number of them that don't even use, allow groundwater for use in irrigation. Um, so um, rainwater quality can, is usually very good. If you're just going right into the tank and pumping, you don't actually need to do much to it all. Just put a little filter on it for safety and uh, that's about it. But again, it, it depends on the use and um, what is required um, by the municipality for, or the local authority for what the level of that quality needs to be. Spray irrigation is always going to have to be higher quality than subsurface. Yeah, and I'll, I'll note there are cases where, you know, um, you know, where people have tried to use rainwater collection from the surface and rainwater harvesting and, and people have gotten sick, right? Like when you think about birds and the animals that might have access to those surface water reservoirs, especially if you're using a, a pond, for example, right? So it is, there is a, a safety aspect to some of these things and it is necessary to, to treat to a certain level. Um, so, but again, if you're, if you're below ground, if you're keeping it fully out of, uh, you know, any possibility of, of human contact, um, you know, you can, you can often 
use rainwater especially with little or no treatment at all and then a lot of these issues go away and you just clearly got a, a win-win water and energy um so it's 729 we've got one follow-up for you brian i don't know if you can see that uh they ask how do you think about spreading out the filtration for instance before and or after storage well you normally um don't do much treatment before you hit the tank. Uh, you might do a first flush. If you're taking water off a green roof, you have to be a little more careful. Um, you're going to have trouble disinfecting if you're going through a green roof because the, 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 the disinfection looks at um, not only the quarterly of the water, but the transmissivity of getting the light through it. So. If you're taking water off a green roof, for example, you may not be able to use UV disinfection. You're going to have to use either ozone or chlorine, which makes the system much more sophisticated, more space, um, much more expensive also. Um, but you usually we like to filter coming out of the tank. Uh, the tank actually can act as a buffer. It will settle things out if you've got much in it, but then you have to clean the tank every once in a while. But um, spreading the filtering out. You can also, again, if you're disinfecting, the filtration is going to be dictated. If you're not fil disinfecting, you can put one size filter coming off the tank, uh, and then you could put uh, other filters out into the field. So if you're doing drip, you can put your drip filters out at the zone valves and do less uh, filtration at the source. Okay, well, um, Shauna, Brian, or Derek, do you have any final comments before we wrap it up this evening? Um, no, the only thing what, that I was thinking when I, at the end of both of, well, I guess, yes, I guess at the end of both, both Brian and Derek's presentation, it would be interesting to have a model together that's modeling the, um, not only the energy and the water um, benefits, system benefits and costs, but also the economic cost as well. You know, putting those two packages together in some way would be interesting. The payback costs. I'd certainly be happy to partner up with Brian and, and tackle that on, <laughs> on a project. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll come up with one somewhere to do that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, um, two things before we go. First, thank you. That was a terrific presentation. We've gotten quite a few compliments in the chat. Um, and I think it was really terrific. Great information uh, for everyone who attended. Thank you um, for coming to talk to us tonight. Thank you to all the attendees for hanging in there. Um, and finally, there's a, a note about when will we be um, posting this. It is being recorded and usually it takes the BSA just about a week or a week and a half or so to get it posted on the site. So when you go back to the code events section, you'll find a link to this um, recording in about a week or, or two weeks or so at the most. Um, so again, I hope everybody has a great evening. Hope to see you next month for Embodied Carbon and uh, have a great night. So long. Good night, everybody. Thanks a lot. Take care.